Good morning. We are back for another chapter from Desire of Ages. Chapter 31, The Sermon on the Mount. Christ seldom gathered his disciples alone to receive his words. He did not choose for his audience those only who knew the way of life. It was his work to reach the multitudes who were in ignorance and error. He gave his lessons of truth where they could reach the darkened understanding. He himself was the truth, standing with girded loins and hands over outstretched to bless, ever outstretched to bless and in words of warning, entreaty, and encouragement, seeking to uplift all who would come unto him. The Sermon on the Mount, though given especially to the disciples, was spoken in the hearing of the multitude. After the ordination of the apostles, Jesus went with them to the seaside. Here in the early morning, the people had begun to assemble. Besides the usual crowds from the Gal Galilean towns, there were people from Judea, even from Jerusalem itself, from Perea, from Decapolis, from Edumia, away to the south of Judea, and from Tyre and Sidon and Phoenician cities on the shore of the Mediterranean. When they had heard what great things he did, they came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. There went virtue out of him and healed them all. Na the narrow beach did not afford even standing room within reach of his voice for all who desired to hear him, and Jesus led the way back to the mountainside, reaching a level space that offered a pleasant gathering place for the vast assembly. He seated himself on the grass, and the disciples and the multitude followed his example. The disciples' place was always next to Jesus. The people constantly pressed upon him, Yet the disciples understood that they were not to be crowded away from his presence. They sat close beside him that they might not lose a word of his instruction. They were attentive listeners, eager to understand the truths they were to make known to all lands and all ages. With the feeling that something more than usual might be expected, they now pressed about their master. They believed that the kingdom was soon to be established, and from the events of the morning, they gathered assurance that some announcement concerning it was about to be made. A feeling of expectancy pervaded the multitude also, and eager faces gave evidence of the deep interest. As the people sat upon the green hillside awaiting the words of the divine teacher, their hearts were filled with thoughts of future glory. There were scribes and Pharisees who looked forward to the day when they should have dominion over the hated Romans and possess the riches and splendor of the world's great empire. The poor peasants and fishermen hoped to hear the assurance that their wretched hovels, the scanty food, the life of toil and fear of want were to be exchanged for mansions of plenty and days of ease. In place of the one coarse garment which was their covering by day and their blanket at night, they hoped that Christ would give them the rich and costly robes of their conquerors. All hearts thrilled with the proud hope that Israel was soon to be honored before the nations as the chosen of the Lord, and Jerusalem exalted as the head of, the universal, of a universal kingdom. Christ disappointed the hope of worldly greatness. In the Sermon on the Mount, he sought to undo the work that had been wrought by false education and to give his hearers a right conception of his kingdom and of his character. Yet he did not make a direct attack on the errors of the people. He saw the misery of the world on account of sin, yet he did not present before them a vivid delineation of their wretchedness. He taught them of something infinitely better than they had known. Without combating their ideas of the kingdom of God, he told them the conditions of entrance therein, leaving them to draw their own conclusions as to its nature. The truths he taught are no less important to us than to the multitude that followed him. We no less than they need to learn the foundation principles of the kingdom of God. Christ's first words to the people on the mount were words of blessing. 
Happy are they, he said, who recognize their spiritual poverty and feel their need of redemption. The gospel is to be preached to the poor, not to the spiritually proud, those who claim to be rich and in need of nothing. It is revealed, but to those who are humble and contrite. One fountain only has been opened for sin, a fountain for the poor in spirit. The proud heart strives to earn salvation, but both our title to heaven and our fitness for it are found in the righteousness of Christ. The Lord can do nothing toward the recovery of man until convinced of his own weakness and stripped of all self-sufficiency. He yields himself to the control of God. Then he can receive the gift that God is waiting to bestow. From the soul that feels his need, nothing is withheld. He has unrestricted access to him in whom all fullness dwells. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. By these words, Christ does not teach that mourning in itself has power to remove the guilt of sin. He gives no sanction to pretense or to voluntary humility. The mourning of which he speaks does not consist in melancholy and lamentation. While we sorrow on account of sin, we are to rejoice in the precious privilege of being children of God. We often sorrow because our evil deeds bring unpleasant consequences to ourselves, but this is not repentance. Real sorrow for sin is the result of the working of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit reveals the ingratitude of the heart that has slighted and grieved the Savior, and brings us in contrition to the foot of the cross. By every sin Jesus is wounded afresh, and as we look upon him whom we have pierced, we mourn for the sins that have brought anguish upon him. Such mourning will lead to the renunciation of sin. The worldly may pronounce this sorrow weakness, but it is the strength which binds the penitent to the infinite one with links that cannot be broken. It shows that the angels of God are bringing back to the soul the graces that were lost through hardness of heart and transgression. The tears of the penitent are only the raindrops that precede the sunshine of holiness. This sorrow heralds a joy which will be a living fountain in the soul. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord. Unto them that mourn in Zion he is appointed to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And for those who also mourn in trial and sorrow there is comfort. The bitterness of grief and humiliation is better than the indulgences of sin. Through affliction God reveals to us the plague spots in our character, that by His grace we may overcome our faults. Unknown chapters in regard to ourselves are open to us, and the test comes whether we will accept the reproof and the counsel of God. When brought into trial, we are not to fret and complain. We should not rebel or worry ourselves out of the hand of Christ. We are to humble the soul before God. The ways of the Lord are obscure to him who desires to see things in a light pleasing to himself. They appear dark and joyless to our human nature. But God's ways are ways of mercy, and the end is salvation. Elijah knew not what he was doing when in the desert he said that he had had enough of life and prayed that he might die. The Lord in his mercy did not take him at his word. There was yet a great work for Elijah to do, and when his work was done, he was not to perish in discouragement and solitude in the wilderness. Not for him the descent into the dust of death, but the ascent into glory, with the convoy of celestial chariots to the throne on high. God's word for the sorrowing is, I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. Blessed are the meek. The difficulties we have to encounter may be very much lessened by that meekness which hides itself in Christ. 
If we possess the humility of our master, we shall rise above the slights, the rebuffs, the annoyances to which we are daily exposed, and they will cease to cast a gloom over the spirit. The highest evidence of nobility in a Christian is self-control. He who under abuse or cruelty fails to maintain a calm and trustful spirit robs God of his right to reveal in him his own perfection of character. Lowliness of heart is the strength that gives victory to the followers of Christ. It is the token of their connection with the courts above. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. Those who reveal the meek and lowly spirit of Christ are tenderly regarded by God. They may be looked upon with scorn by the world, but they are of great value in his sight. Not only the wise, the great, the beneficent will gain a passport to the heavenly courts. Not only the busy worker, full of zeal and restless activity. No, the poor in spirit, who crave the presence of an abiding Christ, the humble in heart, whose highest ambition is to do God's will. These will gain an abundant entrance. They will be among that number who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The sense of unworthiness will lead the heart to hunger and thirst for righteousness, and this desire will not be disappointed. Those who make room in their hearts for Jesus will realize his love. All who long to bear the likeness of the character of God shall be satisfied. The Holy Spirit never leaves unassisted the soul who is looking unto Jesus. He takes of the things of Christ and shows them unto him. If the eye is kept fixed on Christ, the work of the Spirit ceases not until the soul is conformed to his image. The pure element of love will expand the soul, giving it a capacity for higher attainments, for increased knowledge of heavenly things, so that it will not rest short of the fullness. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The merciful shall find mercy, and the pure in heart shall see God. Every impure thought def that defiles the soul impairs the moral sense and tends to obliterate the impressions of the Holy Spirit. It dims the spiritual vision so that men cannot behold God. The Lord may and does forgive the repenting sinner, but though forgiven, the soul is marred. All impurity of speech or of thought must be shunned by him who would have clear discernment of spiritual truth. But the words of Christ cover more than freedom from sensual impurity, more than freedom from that ceremonial defilement which the Jews so rigorously shunned. Selfishness prevents us from beholding God. The self-seeking spirit judges of God as altogether such a one as itself. Until we have renounced this, we cannot understand him who is love. Only the unselfish heart, the humble and trustful spirit, shall see God as merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Blessed are the peacemakers. The peace of Christ is born of truth. It is harmony with God. The world is at enmity with the law of God. Sinners are at enmity with their maker. And as a result, they are at enmity with one another. But the psalmist declares, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Men cannot manufacture peace. Human plans for the purification, uplifting of individuals or of society will fail of producing peace because they do not reach the heart. The only power that can create or perpetuate true peace is the grace of Christ. When this is implanted in the heart, it will cast out the evil passions that cause strife and dissension. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree and life's desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. The multitudes were amazed at this teaching, which was so at variance with the precepts and examples of the Pharisees. The people had come to think that happiness consisted in the possession of the things of this world, and that fame and the honor of men were much to be coveted. It was very pleasing to be called rabbi and to be extolled as wise and religious, having their virtues paraded before the public. 
This was regarded as the crown of happiness. But in the presence of that vast throng, Jesus declared that earthly gain and honor were all the reward such persons would ever receive. He spoke with certainty, and a convincing power attended his words. The people were silenced, and a feeling of fear crept over them. They looked at one another doubtfully. Who of them would be saved if this man's teachings were true? Many were convicted that this remarkable teacher was actuated by the Spirit of God, and that the sentiments he uttered were divine. After explaining what constitutes true happiness, and how it may be obtained, Jesus more definitely pointed out the duty of his disciples as teachers chosen of God to lead others into the path of righteousness and eternal life. He knew that they would be often that they would often suffer from disappointment and discouragement and that they would meet with decided opposition that they would be insulted and their testimony rejected. Well, he knew that in the fulfillment of their mission, the humble men who listened so attentively to his words were to bear calumny, torture, imprisonment, and death. And he continued, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. The world loves sin and hates righteousness, and this was the cause of its hostility to Jesus. All who refuse his infinite love will find Christianity a disturbing element. The light of Christ sweeps away the darkness that covers their sins, and the need of reform is made manifest. While those who yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit begin war with themselves, those who cling to sin war against the truth and its representatives. Thus strife is created, and Christ's followers are accused as troublers of the people. But it is fellowship with God that brings them the world's enmity. They are bearing the reproach of Christ. They are treading the path that has been trodden by the noblest of the earth. Not with sorrow, but with rejoicing, should they meet persecution. Each fiery trial is God's agent for their refining. Each is fitting them for their work as co-laborers with Him. Each conflict has its place in the great battle for righteousness, and each will add to the joy of their final triumph. Having this in view, the test of their faith and patience will be cheerfully accepted rather than dreaded and avoided. Anxious to fulfill their obligation to the world, Fixing their desire upon the approval of God, his servants are to fulfill every duty, irrespective of the fear or the favor of men. Ye are the salt of the earth, Jesus said. Do not withdraw yourselves from the world in order to escape persecution. You are to abide among men that the savor of the divine love may be a salt to preserve the world from corruption. Hearts that respond to the influence of the Holy Spirit are the channels through which God's blessings flow. Were those who serve God removed from the earth and His Spirit withdrawn from men, this world will be left to desolation and destruction, the fruit of Satan's dominion. Though the wicked know it not, they owe even the blessings of this life to the presence in the world of God's people, whom they despise and oppress. But if Christians are such in name only, they are like the salt that has lost its savor. They have no influence for good in the world. Through their misrepresentation of God, they are worse than unbelievers. Ye are the light of the world. The Jews thought to confine the benefits of salvation to their own nation. But Christ showed them that salvation is like the sunshine. It belongs to the whole world. The religion of the Bible is not to be confined between the covers of a book, nor within the walls of a church. It is not to be brought out occasionally for our own benefit, and then to be carefully laid aside again. It is to sanctify the daily life, to manifest itself in every business transaction, and in all our social relations. True character is not shaped from without and put on, it radiates from within, if we wish to direct others to the path of righteousness, the principles of righteousness must be enshrined in our own hearts. Our profession of faith may proclaim the theory of religion, 
but it is our practical piety that holds forth the word of truth. The consistent life, the holy conversation, the unswerving integrity, the active benevolent spirit, the godly example, these are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world.